Hello everyone, I'm here with uh, Mark Hobbs. Thank you for your time. Good to be here, thank you. And um, l let me start with something simple, just introduce yourself. Yeah, so my name is Mark. I am um, I'm a, a role-playing game designer um, as, as a hobby, not as my actual full-time job. Yeah, um, and, <laughs> sure. Uh, <laughs> I live in Olympia in Washington State in the United States, and um, I've been working on designing role-playing games for uh, about 10 years now, um, it's, just kind of off and on. It's quite a spell of time. Yeah, yeah. I've been playing and, and working on them for that long, um, and in my the rest of my life, I work for the state government, and I do part of our, uh, our like, Work, workers uh, insurance okay. healthcare program. It's not a very exciting thing, so I'm not really going to talk about yeah, it. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's not a problem. After all, our, <laughs> our main top topic tonight or today, it depends uh, where you're seeing this, would be mm -hmm. uh, game designing and role playing game in general. Yeah. So uh, you've just um, launched uh, a, a, a successful Kickstarter, right? For a game yeah, uh, Epitaph. called Epitaph, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Can you talk about it? Yeah, I would love to. So Epitaph is this biographical kind of um, timeline building game where you create someone who is uh, who has died. And then the game mostly focuses on exploring the timeline of their life and learning about the important events that happened to them that kind of created who they became. Um, throughout their life. So the Kickstarter, the Kickstarter was great. I was really happy with how it went. Um, I'm one of the know, maker, by the way. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, I, you know, I, I feel like the funny thing about Kickstarter for a lot of role playing game projects, especially very small scale ones, is mm -hmm. that, um, you know, you don't have to have particularly ambitious financial goals to be successful because like, Realistically, the production cost is me, right? Writing the game and then buying art is really the main other cost that I have and then printing the books. So mm -hmm. it's not like I'm inventing a new product and I need a bunch of capital to start. Like I kind of have a lot of the work already done by the time the Kickstarter is happening. So it, it puts a little bit different pressure on how I approach the Kickstarter because it's less about like, I need this money to make the thing like I kind of already made the thing yeah. by using the, the program <laughs> I, I, to kind of just need, help get need the, the money out. to yeah to um, exactly to, to finish the product and yeah and, or, and to fin and polishing it of course exactly and, and uh, like being able to add more stuff if if want to hear um well uh, a funny story of how I like I I found yeah. the project uh, <laughs> it's a little bit morbid but uh, it's fun <laughs> well um so is the game, like, so there you go. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but mm, the, the story is more morbid, is more bit there. I don't know if it exists as a yeah. word. Um, like three or four months ago, uh, I, I had this idea in my head to, to find or to write a game about um, a person who has committed suicide mm. to explore mm -hmm. this very, very uh, hard and deep theme. Yeah. And uh, since uh, Mark Zuckerberg is listening to us, <laughs> mm -hmm, Facebook mm -hmm. just suggested to me uh, your game on Kickstarter, and that that's immediately clicked. I, I was like, oh, wow, it's that's perfect for for what I I, I want yeah. to to play. Uh, well, it, it, clearly it's not the only way you can play the game, but mm -hmm. I think that you can play a game uh, where uh, your protagonist, the the person who who's died. Uh, mm -hmm. has committed suicide, right? Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, you could totally do that. Um, I have not personally done a game with a suicide yet. Um, and I don't think that's because... It's certainly not because you couldn't. You can, for yeah. sure. It's just that it's hard. Like, that's a really serious topic. Topic to, to address. And, yeah, you would need to make sure everybody in your group is, like, ready to go there because it's, yeah, it's going to be heavy. Definitely. But it, I think it would be great for that. I think it would be very interesting. And uh, uh, speaking of, of this topic, uh, have you like included in your game any uh, safety tools? 
I do have some. Yeah. Um, right at the beginning, I use a very popular mechanic called the X card. Yeah. Um, which it sounds like you're familiar with. Um, yeah, but, but just, just to, mm, to uh, review what about, it is. Yeah, for, for our viewers. For the viewers. Um, the X card is basically like a, a physical card um, if you're playing with real uh, in, in real space instead of online. Um, online, you just have to sort of talk because you can't you know, have physical things. But um, it's a card with an X on it. And if you get to any content in the game that makes you feel uncomfortable, it takes you out of the game you know, into your head because now you're not you're not having fun. You're thinking too much. It's 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 bringing up something that's painful for you. Um, then you can touch the card or point to the card or say X card or pretty much anything to indicate to the other players. Hey, whoa, let's pause. Mm. I need to take something out of the. Yeah, for right for now. instance, uh, when I play online with my group, mm -hmm. uh, you, usually I use uh, this website called uh, Roll for Your Party, which is for uh, dice rolling. Yeah. I think I've seen that one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, uh, well, that, there's a button. There's an, an X card button, so you can yeah. click it, and everyone is like informed that someone has mm -hmm. clicked the X button or <laughs> X card button. And... Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I have seen that. That's right. Yeah, and so there are a lot of mechanical ways you can do it online too, mm -hmm. for yep. sure. Um, and any and other so... uh, safety tools in, included in the game? Yeah, there's, there's actually two more. Um, the mm -hmm. other one is just a disclaimer in the text that you sort of go over with everybody, which is, okay. I think, kind of an extension of the X card. And it's I've heard it called the door's always open. Um, basically, the idea is that you want players to understand that their experience of having fun playing the game is more important than the game. And so if someone gets to a point where they're saying, whoa, this, is, this whole game is getting heavy for me and I... I need to take a break. I need to, you know, talk it out. I need to just stand up for five minutes and come back, or I need to walk. Right? I need to like, I, I don't want to play and I want to get out of here. They need to feel like that's okay for them to do because it is. Because I mean, nobody wants their other players in the game to be suffering and sitting there like unhappy and not having a good time. So explicitly saying that up front, that like the door is always open if you need to go, it's okay. You don't have to feel guilty about. You know, stopping the game because you're having something happen inside, that's fine. You know, we don't want you to have to go through that and not have a good time. So that's another safety mechanic. And it's it's much more of a giving people permission to take care of themselves. Yeah, to feel unsafe and to to be able to like say it. Exactly. And, yeah. And uh, and be able to say, like, yeah, it's yeah. okay. That's interesting. That's something that um, I tend to do uh, in, in in my recent games. Uh, I well mm, before the first session or before the the game session, I play this very quick uh, workshop mm -hmm. in which uh, everyone is playing a scene, and everyone is uh, like uh, forced to uh, stop it, e even mm. though you're not like stressed about it or like. Uh, even though no topics um, has like um, um, made you feel uncomfortable, but yeah. ju just the thing that you are like forced to do it, and like okay, uh, ju just stop the scene. Mm -hmm. It's like well, everyone is like okay, we have done it. Nothing's wrong with with it. It's not mm -hmm. like you're a chicken and you're like a chicken out of yeah. the situation and. And I, I, I think that uh, safety mechanics and safety tools are a really important thing in um, in the role-playing game world. Yeah, and I completely it, it, agree. Yeah, I really like I like what you just described. I think that's really cool. Kind of having a practice round. Sorry, I keep hitting this cord. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> having like a no practice worries. round. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, of, well, it's something I'm, yeah. I well I stole from the LARP games. And yeah, they do the, a, a, yeah. a lot of workshop be, be, before the actual game. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the LARPs I've been in are like they have some of them have the same words of like the the slow down or stop or time yeah, out. Ritual, kind of, they have a lot of different terms. Ritual yeah. words and, and stuff mm -hmm. like that, or more uh, tailored safety tools. And yeah. uh, uh, since you said that uh, you you've never played um, a, a, a game of epitaph with a, a suicide. Can yeah, you, I haven't. Yeah, can you um, tell us uh, a game 
that you play tested well um, um, a session of epitaph that you play tested that you consider the, the most like interesting the the one you, you remember the most for whatever reason yeah, <clears throat> yeah I can um, I, I mean I played a lot of really interesting games of epitaph and I'm looking at my my list here what one of the <laughs> best things about playing online is that I have extensive notes about every game because you're we're using a Google Doc so we're like typing out the whole timeline and all the character stuff and it's all right there so I just have like a list of all of my all the games that I've played online like right here and do you ever um, re record the the session I haven't done that um, I haven't done that yet and that's partly because it's just it's just a lot of work <laughs> to do <laughs> as as you know um, I yeah mostly just because I haven't taken the taken the time to do it um, but I certainly could just haven't yet um, one of the ones that I really liked um, that we did was a a woman a story of a woman who wanted to uh, revive this summer camp that she went to when she was a kid so like the premise was she went to this camp a lot and then the camp closed and then her goal in her life was to revive the summer camp and bring it back and um she did she actually did do that um and the story kind of it's it's bittersweet because she successfully revives the camp she reopens it and um then like two years later she dies trying to fix something at the camp she like falls off a building oh okay so, so <laughs> she uh she dies yeah. on the camp actually mm -hmm. okay. at the camp mm -hmm. <laughs> at, at, at the camp yeah and so um and i think that gets back to a, a, a better question of like what happens in epitaph right so when you make the game the first thing you do that's the third safety mechanic i wanted to mm -hmm. mention um which is in the game itself it's something that i stole from <laughs> another game um called the pallet um oh yeah uh, i yeah. think it comes from microscope this one My yes okay yeah <laughs> and i can <laughs> i, I can here. sense it's one of your um bigger uh, like in inspiration yeah absolutely mm -hmm. Yeah. When I set out to make Epitaph, one of the first things I did, I wrote at the top of my notes was, this is not microscope. Um, <laughs> because there's so much like that they are, there's a lot of connection there. Mm -hmm. And this is a little bit of a tangent, but one of the things that I think about a lot when I'm working on design is, um, is there another game that already does this? Right. Like if I have an idea for a game, I say, well, wait a minute, I got to think about the other games that I know. Yeah. And if one of them already does that, then is there room for me to make a game? Should I even make it or should I just play the other game that exists? Yeah. So th that's exactly the, the same thoughts I had. I, I had when I had yeah, this, this uh, like uh, need of a game about suicide. Mm -hmm. which and is I think very morbid, but OK, it's, 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 it's morbid. But I think there's <laughs> yeah, I completely agree with you that there's like you have to, you can, you can kind of go two directions, right? You can say, okay, my idea is already expressed in another game and there's not, I don't really think there's something I want to make that's different than this game. Or you can say, well, I have the same idea, but there's another way to explore it. And that's when I think you can, you can take it the new direction and say, well, I want to do this thing. The existing game doesn't quite get where I want to go. So I'm going to try a different direction, you know? There's, there's plenty of room in the world for multiple games about every topic yeah. because they come at it from different angles. Anyway, so I stole the palette from Microscope um, with permission <laughs> from, from oh, okay. Ben um, Robbins. Uh, and um, I consider that to be a safety mechanic because it is a... It is a what's the word I'm looking for? It sets expectations at mm -hmm. the table where everybody understands what topics are acceptable oh, and which ones well, are kind of uh, not. Since I'm, um, well, I, I'm familiar with, with the concept of the palette, but maybe the viewers oh, yeah. are not. So can you Let explain, explain more, sure. briefly what, what the palette is and how does it yeah. work? So in Epitaph, um, the way you make the palette is you sit down together and you have um, three, three columns in boxes, right? One of them says things about the world, one of them says things about the departed, who's the main character of your story. And one of them says, not in this story. And basically, the palette is you take turns going around the group saying, yes, I want this topic. I'm interested in this topic. I would like it to show up. Um, I think it would be great if it showed up. Or no, 
I don't want this topic in the story um, today. It's just not something I'm interested in exploring. And this can really, I mean, it's really broad, but it's not the same as the X card. The X card is like, I bring up something in, in while we're playing and another player's like, whoa, whoa, I that makes me uncomfortable. I don't think I want to talk about this right now. Um, where the palette is a little more like we're, we're planning ahead. We're thinking, okay, well, I don't know if I want to talk about war today. So we're just going to put that topic in the no list. We're not going to talk about war. Um, and I guess what I'll say about the palette is that like some, it takes a little bit of social understanding because if the game isn't going to be about war, like this summer camp game I told you about, right? Mm -hmm. There's, there's almost no circumstance where like war would come up in that setting. So there's really no need to put it on the no list. It's like you don't have to put every single thing in the yeah, world sure. on the no but list. For instance, I, I can put uh, like violence on the no list. Right. Maybe not because I, violence make me uncomfortable, but because I want a story with no violence involved. Except right, for the, exactly. the death of the, well, of the departed, of, of course. Yeah, <laughs> of course. And even that, you know, you can, you can massage that to be less yeah, violent it, kind of thing. You can die in a non-violent way. Exactly. So the palette, um, it, the palette is a collaborative step, right? Everybody has to sort of say, oh yeah, okay, I agree to have that or not have that um, in the story. And it, it works alongside the X card um, in that if somebody brings up something later that you haven't put on the palette, now you have a tool to get rid of it if yeah. you don't want to talk about it. Yeah, to me, the, the palette, it's both a safety tool and a tool for uh, aesthetic control. Mm -hmm. Because, for instance, I can put on a palette uh, on a no column uh, suicide or violence or uh, like a, a car crash or, or something mm -hmm. like that because it ma it makes me feel uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Or I can put it on the list because I don't want uh, that in my in, in that particular game for aesthetic reason. Mm -hmm. And that's something that happened um, when I played M Microscope. Uh, for instance, uh, once I played, uh, well, the, the period covered by the game was like a spa uh, space opera, mm -hmm. and of course I put on the no uh, uh, on the no list uh, on the no column list uh, like psionic powers, but mm. of course I've I've nothing. <laughs> well, psionic powers is not, it, they don't make me uncomfortable. It just right, okay. Right. I, I just don't want the, uh, them in You're my in, in this game. Yeah. I'm, I'm, yeah. So Not it's, bo it's yeah. both uh, a safety tool and, uh, and you can control the setting of the game with the, the palette. So it's a very powerful yeah. tool. Extremely powerful. Yeah, I agree completely, which is why I wanted it in, in Epitaph, because it Epitaph can be a very challenging game when it's talking about death. And people people don't, you know, it's uncomfortable. Just straight up, it's uncomfortable to talk about for some people, um, for most people. But uh, having the ability to... To, to steer the story and steer the aesthetic, as you called it, um, I think is is a really helpful way to make that okay and to make people feel more comfortable talking about these difficult things. Yeah. Um, to, yeah. Uh, uh, speaking about talking about difficult themes and addressing difficult things, well, uh, Epitha uh, Epitaph, well, the games, um, talk, the game talks about death. Mm -hmm. And it's something that we tend to not not think about it. Like we, we tend to think that we are immortal, mm -hmm. and our, our our brain is wired in that way. So uh, playing a game that address directly this theme, uh, I think that's very brave. And and so I wanted to ask you uh, why you wanted to uh, write a game about death. Yeah. Um... That's a really that's a really good question. I think one of the things I've come to realize in working on this game is that I thought that it was a game about death. And when I originally came up with the idea for it, it it really was about that. It was about the dying and the being dead part. But as I worked on the game, I came to realize that actually the story is the the life. It's the before part. Um, and I'll say kind of two things about that. The first is that the original version of this game was mm -hmm. very, very different from the okay. final product. Um, in the original version, it was much more like you were in the afterlife and there was like you were looking at your memories and like it had a very different vibe. It was a lot more about this question of 
what is uh, holding me back from moving on, you know, okay. in my after my death. And that's one story, but that I realized that wasn't the kind of game I wanted to make and that it wasn't working how I wanted it to. So I threw that all out, kind of started over. Um, and I realized the question that was more interesting to me was not, um, it's not the how or why did I die? It's it's like the who was I? Who was this person? And so um, talking about, uh, you talk about the death because you need to fix that point on the timeline. And you don't want it to me. What I realized early on in the design process of this is that you don't want it to be a mystery because that's not the game I wanted to make. Um, when you set up something like that as a mystery, then the players fixate, right? They really want to know, okay, I got to figure this out. How did this person die? And like, it's and, all the details, right? And who, and, and who done it and stuff like that. Who done it, it and yeah. stuff. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so if you reveal all that up front and just say, nope, this is it. All the details right here, everything you want to know, this is the death. Then that allows people the freedom to like stop focusing on it and to go back and say, well, wait a minute. Now I have a thousand questions about how did they get there, right? Why was she at the summer camp? What were her experiences there? Why did she want to revive it? You know, and and that's where you develop the story of the game is um, talking about how the person's life ended gets you interested in what they did before their life ended, and it helps you become curious about them. Mm -hmm. So, getting back to your question of why did I want to make a game about death, um, I think that my initial motivation was those kind of stories where the character is looking back at a memory and like thinking, okay, why am I remembering this? Or like, what does this mean to me? You know, like they don't fully understand right away. And then they have these kind of flashes of insight, like, oh, I get now that what this moment means to me or how it fits into the bigger picture of my life, you know? Um, and that was my initial kind of drive was to make a game that could replicate that experience. Um, it's an experience that we we can see in movies sometimes, but we don't get to have very often in our real lives because yeah. you don't get to have perfect hindsight. This is this is exactly what I, um, I wanted to add to mm -hmm. to yeah. this and 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 why to me. Uh, this second version of, of the, uh, this uh, definitive version is more powerful than the first version that you described mm -hmm. because you know uh, death is like one of the <laughs> biggest mis mis mystery in uh, human life yeah and we don't know like anything about well what it's like to be dead right right but we know what it's like to be a person that have, have, has and have, has lost uh, someone mm -hmm. so i think that uh this final version is really more powerful also because it um it addresses another topic which is how uh, other people remember you mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. is something that uh, your game um, addresses right to some extent yeah um the game there's a couple of caveats to that i will say which is mm -hmm. that the game ends at the death. Um, the only time you talk about stuff that happens after that is in the very the epilogue of the game. When you're okay. done exploring the timeline, then you talk about how people remember this person. Um, but I think that the way that we explore the relationships that they build in their life, because here's the trick, right, is during your life, you meet a lot of people, but they don't all stay with you until the end. Right? Think about all the friends that you've had or people you've known that you don't know anymore that are just sort of gone. Yeah. But at some phase of your life, they were there and they were important. And I think that there's, because you can jump around the timeline freely, you get these kind of um, interesting moments where you see that relationship happening and how critically important it was just in this little span of time. And then maybe it's gone, but that person still exists, right? And they still have memories of you so i guess to put it another way it's like if you if you think about when somebody dies everybody that's in their life at that moment gets to sort of have this memory of them but there are people whose last moment 
with this person was 20 yeah, years earlier. Yeah, well, and they way, still way have before, a yeah. memory. Yeah, way earlier. So I'm not quite sure how to... I think you get where I'm saying that with this, but it's we don't have just one fixed point in time where, okay, from here, everything we do is a memory. That actually happens a lot during our lives. And you get to see all those things. You get to kind of have a picture of, okay, what was the last impression of this person who saw the departed and then never saw them again before they died? So, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I understand your, your point. And um, I wanted to ask, um, well, I just wanted to say that uh, another thing that like um, really, um, well, I, I really appreciate about Epitaph it's that it's that it's a role playing game that address a, a really mundane topic or well with, with a lot of mundane scenes on mm -hmm. or mundane stories yeah uh, it's like mm, i have a, um, a way to describe this game it's like a, a kitchen sink game mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because well it's a game that um, talks about small things and not about big adventures and an epic mm, quest and, and stuff like, like that and i yeah. i think that uh in the um, well in in the role playing industry uh, we need more games that are that address this topic hmm. uh because i i think that well uh games like like this can make the the hobby uh like grow and and they can make the, the hobby more profound uh, or deeper uh, yeah yeah i agree and do you have any uh, like any other inspiration uh, except for uh, mi microscope yeah you know i've been thinking a lot about that because i'm working <laughs> on that part of the text right now um that's like one of the last little bits of of the, the, text, the, the text i have text, to do before to, we get to the layout to, to with, um yeah is like the inspirations and stuff. And it's it's been challenging because I think there's there's like so either so many inspirations that um it's it's hard to to narrow down. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, any story that deals with loss or reflection is going to be kind of it kind of fits what epitaph is about. Like you said, the expression that came to my head was slice of life. That yeah. like, it's not about yeah this massive quest. I mean, it could be if you wanted. Sure, the person that you talk about could have a massive quest that they spend a bunch of their life doing, but you still get all the parts where they're like hanging out in camp, and then after the quest is over, what do they do? And then like when they were a kid, what do they do? You know, like you can do all that stuff. You don't have to do the quest part. Yeah, and the, and the most important thing is that the game like uh, shift the focus from the quest to the character. Mm -hmm. and 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 to uh, like the, the memories of, of of the of the people um they met in their life and stuff like, and stuff like that i i think that uh, hypothetically you can uh, play a game of epitaph where the departed is a, a great hero but the the focus is completely is completely different from uh let's yeah. say a dungeons and dragons game right where the focus is is the quest yeah, I think that would be really cool. I want to tell you about another one that I played mm -hmm. um, that was sure a little bit like that. It was about um, our character was named Sirna, um, and this was like a fantasy setting with sort of animal magic. Like people could talk to certain animals. Like that was kind of the the thing. And then she was like a sword fighter, right? Mm -hmm. um, and her whole life was very much shaped by like class struggle in her family because her family was noble but she was like born out of wedlock and then like um hmm. her sister you know was was picked to go be a wizard at like some secret school somewhere um but but like the whole you could easily have told her story as this epic adventure of like her losing the family home in this um inheritance dispute and then trying like fighting and fighting to get it back that was what was what the straight line plot was of the the story but we jumped around a whole bunch and like built that up 
asymmetrically or, or uh, yep. achronologically. And in the end, the moments we focused on were not really the quest. They were the moments of like feeling and and hope and despair that she had as she was dealing with all those problems. Um, so like you said, yeah, you can play the whole game with a quest and never talk about the quest. Yeah, sure. And um, well, let's change the topic and mm -hmm. let's talk about something more like general. Sure. Like uh, the role playing games that um, they are more um, that like shaped your view of the hobby the most. Like uh, yeah. to me, for instance, uh, I, uh, probably the game that um, helped me to like shift the focus from do the adventure, uh, kill the dragon, and stuff mm -hmm. like that, and and realize that you can use the this medium to tell other stories. Probably it was uh, Monster Heart. Oh yeah, mm. by um, Avery Adler. Mm -hmm. And uh, because well, it's a game that um, well, the protagonists they are monsters, so they are vampires, werewolf, and stuff like that. But uh, every monster is a metaphor for um, like an issue, uh, an issue that teenagers uh, have in in their life and. Mm -hmm. Well, and it addressed uh, like a, a lot of topics, like uh, the the pain of growing, gr growing up, uh, how it's difficult to uh, find your identity, especially your sexual identity, mm -hmm. and, and stuff like and stuff like that. Uh, what what was uh, your uh, most uh, influential game you, you ever played? Oh, that is a really hard question. <laughs> yeah, I know. I've played well, a it, lot of story games. <laughs> if you want, you can uh, answer with three games. I'll give you a top easier three. Sure, than, sure. Yeah, top yeah, three yeah, or yeah. top five. Top three, top five. I brought, like I said, I brought some props. Um, okay. I want to tell you a little bit about some of them. So um, I already held up Microscope before. Mm -hmm. um, Microscope is definitely one of the most inspirational games for me. Um, and you've played it too, but just for your, your listeners um, okay. or your viewers rather. Microscope is a timeline building game, kind of like Epitaph, uh, where you have what they call the bookends in the, the, the game of you're building a history. And so you can make that history a year, you could make it 10,000 years or whatever you want. And what you do is you kind of zoom in and in and in to very specific moments and then back out again to like large periods of time. And the game is played out of order. So you can jump all around, go to the fall of the empire, then jump back to the founding of the empire, all that kind of thing. Um, but this game, playing this game, um, I think did for me a very similar thing to what you described, which was get out of the kill the dragon, get the loot mindset that I started in. Because I started with D&D like many people um, yeah, when like I was me, young. Like me, for instance. Like, like uh, a lot of people. I, I like to say that I, I was born in Dungeons and Dragons because mm. uh, like 30, 40 years ago, no, 35 years ago, Uh, my father and my mother used to play D&D together. Oh, wow. Yeah, my father was the dungeon master and my mother played a um, human wizard. A human male wizard. Mm. Mm -hmm. and Is that how they met? No. No, but they... They already they knew each other, but they played a, a lot together. Mm -hmm. and, and they also translated... Uh, like, back then, um, we, we had an uh, advanced Dungeons and Dragons in Italy. But my father used to travel a lot in the US, so mm -hmm. uh, he bought uh, Advanced Dungeons Dragons from one of his trip, and uh, they translated it together in Italian. So wow. probably I own like the first homemade copy of <laughs> Advanced Dungeons and Dragons uh, in Italian. Wow, which I can that's show so cool. you since you have your prop. I I can also yeah. <laughs> get a prop. Mine. Show Just me. I'm really curious. In a second. That's that's it. I also revealed my green screen. <laughs> <laughs> well, sort of. I can't, you have like a background on, but it's like you sort of fade in and out. Yeah, it it's not. So you kind of vanish into the. It's distance. not a green screen. It's it's just uh, <laughs> a not, the filter. Well, yeah. yeah, you can also you you can use it too because it's an mm -hmm. option um, included in Zoom. Yeah. And uh, this is it. That, that's the, the copy they made wow. in Italian uh, with a. Oh, look at that. 
Yeah, it's is like... That, is that typed or handwritten? Typed, typed. Typed, yeah. And they, they oh. also photocopied the, the, the pictures. Oh, wow. They probably, yeah, I guess, me... what was that? 40 years ago, so typewriter? Uh, Not a computer? Yeah. No, no. Yeah. No computer at, at all. Oof, wow. And That's a lot also of work. like the... Um, I don't know how... <laughs> it's a little blurry, how, how but I can see it, that it's... Yeah, yeah. it's a, a, a lot of wow. work. And, that's crazy. Yeah. That is a really and, and cool that's thing. And their name on the... Oh. Yeah. Oh, that's so sweet. Wow, that's so, really cool. Yeah, so, so, so I like to say that I was born <laughs> in, in Dungeons & Dragons, mm -hmm. but I, 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 I grew a lot from, from that point of view. Which is yeah. well, which is fine, but it's really narrow, as you said before. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of people Dungeon Dragon is obviously being the most popular role playing game, tabletop. Yeah, role probably st game. St still is. Probably still, and definitely has been for many many years. I mean, it, it, it the hobby owes a lot of credit to it for the expansion of the ideas and of the way the mechanics of how games can exist um, that it made. Um, and but but there's so many more avenues to explore now that have just in the last 20 30 years come into existence um yeah and that for me because i played it as a teenager right and then it was there was a break during college where i didn't really do any role playing and then after college i um found it again um thanks to my girlfriend who is now my wife um mm -hmm. caroline and uh one of the first games that i ever played was was microscope so this game expanded the the way that you think about what a game can be, right? Um, another game that I want to show you is one that you probably maybe never heard of. It's called A Penny for My Thoughts. Yeah, I I, um, I, I recently I recently played it. Oh, great! Okay, I, I, um, I actually I played it on the channel. Uh, this interview is going to be up, uh, up, up, uploaded on. Oh, cool! So yeah. Well, that's very convenient that I mentioned it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love this game. Um, this is a hard, emotionally hard game to play, though. Um, and I, when you talked about suicide, it it made me think like, oh, I, I bet you would like this game. So it's really great. Yeah, that you I, actually I, I like it. it. And um, it, even yeah. though I think that the main theme of the game is the fact that you have no control on on your life, which is a lesson that it's it's really handy to to learn early in your life <laughs> that you yeah. have no control <laughs> yeah at yeah. all absolutely and and so i think you hit it on the head that's one of the reasons i love that game is it mm -hmm. it showed me something really interesting and new about how a game can work and what kind of stories you can tell um and i think the last one that i want to to highlight is as a, like a something that really resonated with me um is this little game here yeah. Mars Colony. I know it. You know this one too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, but just probably for... uh, I I I can rem I can recall if uh, Mars Colony is on uh, our channel, so maybe you can like introduce the game briefly. Yeah. Yeah, I'll talk about it for a second. So, um, Mars Colony is a game for two players, which is a pretty rare thing to find. That's uh, a really actually super fun, effective game for two players. Um, one player plays. Uh, Kelly Perkins, and the other player plays what's called the governor, but basically the it's antagonism. The, yeah, it's the, it's the game master of like, yeah the the world, the, the world, everybody yeah. else. Yeah, and the game takes place on the colony, the first car colony on Mars, and there are problems. You get to set up what the problems are, and Kelly has been sent to try to fix them. And so the game revolves a lot around politics and um, like the levers of power and like how do you how do you try to make change happen um but then one of the most brilliant parts about this game is that it um it it dives into the way that we um what's the term here i'll show you like this is the character kind of page here and it may be hard to see on the screen but there's deception admiration and contempt and so like you have this mechanical moving back and forth of the people admire you for what you're doing as Kelly, or the people have contempt for you if you fail, or you can deceive them. So like, you have to keep rolling dice to try to succeed at your plans. Um, but if you fail, you can decide to hide the failure 
and you get credit from the people but you have to put stuff into the deception and then the more deception you build up the more risk you risk run to, like, to... of having a scandal where all your deception is revealed mm -hmm. and you lose all that credibility and you can lose the game like instantly if you have too yeah. much deception and i think that uh, a really s subtle thing that the game does is that uh, from a mm, arithmetic point of view it's really hard or quite impossible to win the ga win the game to, well, to mm -hmm. fix the colony uh, yeah. with no deception Yes, yes, exactly. Like, you almost have to lie. Like, the chances that you will do it are really small. So, yeah. I It's a brilliantly designed game. I love it. Did you ever play the sequel? Uh, well, I, I know that um, it exists. Uh, mm -hmm. It's like the point of view from, like, uh, like, a terrorist group or something like that, right? Yeah, like a, like an uprising or, like, yeah, an anti... Yeah, a, a protest movement, uh, Which is called uh, 42 Dark or something like that. 39 dark. 39 dark because it's 49 minutes uh, the different uh, of the right, day right. the length of the day the yeah, martian exactly. day and the earth day <laughs> the mm -hmm. normal day and yeah, yeah. well um, I, I i know that it, it exists but i never played the uh, that version of the game it's interesting yeah it it does some i haven't played it in a long time so i won't say too much about it but it it explores some new themes, and I think it changes a couple of the mechanics in interesting ways. So definitely worth a glimpse if you uh, if you get a chance. Mm -hmm. So yeah, yeah, I mean, these are three games I played early mm -hmm. in my story gaming career that I, I just still have a very strong connection to because of how different they... The, none of them are about killing dragons, right? <laughs> none of them are about quests. <laughs> um, and they no all... dragons, no loot. And right, no loot, no dragons, no, no doors to 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 kick to kick down. <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. to kick it down. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, usually they just involve a lot of being sad and feeling poignantly human. <laughs> you know, like uh, Mars Colony when you're just trying so hard and then it fails anyway, and yeah. you know, which people is, exploit uh, you. <laughs> which is what I tried to say before in in my broken English. <laughs> which is uh, that well, uh, it's it, it's like uh, comic books. Mm -hmm. Comic comic books in, at the beginning uh, they used to be like just for children or for kids or for teen, mm -hmm. and and people well, grown up people tend to like di dismiss the the medium. Uh, well, dismiss the comic books as a medium. Because mm -hmm. they tend to see it as stuff for children, stuff for ki for kids. Right, right. And it took mm -hmm. like a lot of years to like uh, convince people that uh, a comic book can 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 be deep, can address a serious topic, and stuff yeah. like that. And I think that um, in our in our hobby in uh, role playing game, we are like still at the beginning of this process. But we are making like step uh, ahead. Yeah, I think that's a really smart uh, observation that it's we've moved from D and D, which many people dismissed as either so sort of silly, like oh that's kids, you know, just kids do that, or somehow dangerous, like in America in the nineteen eighties. The nineties, like, yeah. Ah, yeah, it's it's satanic demons, craze, yeah, satanic <laughs> craze, yeah, yeah, that whole thing. To now, yeah, in the twenty twenty here, you can tell incredibly moving and powerful stories with these games that cut right into like our deepest emotional uh, situations um, and of course it's, there's nothing wrong in just killing dragons and kicking down oh, yeah. doors yeah <laughs> totally um, just like escapism yeah. just like it's that nothing wrong with a comic books about su uh, superheroes that they punch villains in in, in the face yeah or if you uh, want to, you know, read read Archie and Jughead yeah. and like, yeah, you know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just have some silly romance fun, like whatever, yeah. it's fine. And but well, it, it's something that the hobby is like moving on and from from that starting point mm -hmm. uh, to more uh, deep, uh, to deeper and more profound uh, issues and topics. Yeah, and I think more diverse too. And diverse, um, yeah. I mean, as as someone who you know living in in the united states in a not not to get super political about this but in, in my in the part of the country where i live um there's a lot more uh attitudes toward 
being more diverse, being more inclusive, being more progressive. Um, I live, you know, only an hour away from Seattle, which I think a lot of people have heard of even around the world um, as a city. And Seattle's a pretty liberal minded place. So yeah, you, you live in the more, liberal belt of the US. The liberal belt, right? You look at that, that election map, yeah. it's the blue coast, <laughs> it's the, right? That's, that's the blue belt. <laughs> that's the blue belt. There's, there's a reason it's mm -hmm. all blue over here. So um, that being said, what I mean is that I think it's really great and useful um, to have so many different voices coming into the hobby. Um, when you start with something that's very monolithic like D&D, &D, um, then, and, and I think for many years, there's just been conversations of how can we increase or, or should we increase the accessibility for different people to be able to play these kind of games. And I think that's what's a lot of what's happening in, um, in game design is to get more people of with different voices to design games to be able to play games to tell these kind of stories and i think that's obviously a fantastic thing and it's really important yeah it's really important uh, also in in um, hindsight or in retrospective for instance let, let's take a classic like vampire the, the masquerade okay it's a game from the 90s mm -hmm. and uh it's like Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, it's like be this super human thing that is damned, but it has a lot of cool powers and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But since the, the hobby uh, is becoming more and more uh, diverse, as you said, you can take a, a, a classic like uh, Vampire the Masquerade and play it in with different approach like exploring um, a more um, uh, a bigger gamut of topics uh, mm -hmm. or trying to have a, a deeper experience because yeah. Vampire the Masquerade is a game that can address a serious topic and not just escapism or being uh, a super cool vampire mm -hmm. uh, with, with uh, powers and, and, and stuff. Yeah, totally. I totally agree. I think that that's ultimately a very good thing for the hobby. I mm -hmm. think it's going to make, as, as we go forward for the next decade or two, it's just going to make so many more cool games yeah. um, available for everybody to, to play. Yeah, we are still not there. And we, mm -hmm. with there, I mean where uh, RPGs are considered a form of art, but we are mm -hmm. definitely working <laughs> on it. <Yeah. laughs> and um And... You, you, um, earlier you talk about your wife, uh, is, yeah. she a, is she a game designer as well? She wrote this Yeah, game. I already knew the answers. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm telling for everybody else to see, yeah. this is downfall. Uh, Caroline Hobbs is my wife. Um, in her day job, she is a community college teacher. This is her classroom for oh, okay. pandemic times. Cool. That's why there's a whiteboard in, in, here. In, during the <laughs> pandemic, yeah. <laughs> during the pandemic, yeah. This is our, this is her room. Um, Yes, yeah, so Caroline and I met in 2010, um, and the like very first thing that we did together was go to the Story Games meetup in Seattle, mm -hmm. um, and that's where we, I mean, basically, we've done that ever since, you know, we've been playing role-playing games together for a long, long time, so... Um, Sorry, I forgot what your question was, or maybe I interrupted your question. No, it it, it, it wasn't a question. It, it, it mm. was like, just talk about your your, yeah. your wife, your, your uh, I'll talk about relationship wife, sure, no about uh, <laughs> role-playing role games or designing games together and stuff like yeah. that. So it's... <laughs> I would love to, yeah. It's not a um, question, it's, the, it, it, it's just a topic. <laughs> topic, yeah. So Caroline and I got into the hobby at the same, roughly the same time. She'd been mm -hmm. going to the meetup a little bit longer than me. Um, and we both kind of became designers around the same time um, in that we we played a lot of story games. Um, I think one of the one of the keys to becoming a designer, um, which is what I was going to say before, Phil, mm. that um, you said at the very beginning that you're like, I'm not sure I could design a game. I think that you could. And I think the reason that you could is because the first step is to play a lot, play of, games. A lot of games of different games. Yeah. yeah. A different exactly different titles it's just like they tell you good writers read a lot right if you've read a ton of books you're getting closer to being able to write one because you've seen a, you've seen things you know and that's the same exact thing with role-playing games the more of these titles that you play the more 
you start to kind of recognize patterns and you start to think about like what works and what doesn't work and um, what you like and what you don't like. Um, and sorry. especially something that you said early, uh, I want to write a game, but maybe this game already exists. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and exactly, yeah. That's a pitfall in which a lot of game designers um, said, sadly, well, they, they tend to fall in, into especially here in, yeah. in Italy because well mm. uh, here in uh, in my country we have yeah. well we have a lot of game, oh, game designers but they they tend to uh, not playing a lot of different titles probably mm -hmm. because uh, a lot of them they they just play um, titles that they are uh, translated in, in Italian yeah so, that can be well, hard for sure the catalog is is, is narrowed down Yeah, but uh, well, mm, uh, well, there's an uh, an industry, a, a kind of the industry of Italian game designer uh, or, or game designing, mm -hmm. but it's still, I, I think, it's mm, at the beginning of of the process. Mm -hmm. It's it's growing. It's developing. Yeah, it's, it's still yeah. growing. Yeah, I do think the language barrier is obviously not a thing. I deal with as much because a lot of yeah sure a lot of game design work is done in english um but i i mean it's it's again it's a constant um back and forth of like i know that there's tons of games out there that are in not in english that i'm i don't know anything about and i won't be able to access because i can't read them but um that are really well, good even so. though a lot of uh, not not english game designer tend to translate their games in english too so because the market right yeah is yeah No, for sure. Um, I have an advantage. I mean, I, I have a privilege there of being an English speaker that I, that I other people don't have. So I, I'm lucky in that regard. Um, I kind of forgot how we got to this. Oh, I was talking about Caroline, right? Yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, we got into the hobby, playing a lot of games, right? So we played tons of games. We went to this meetup for several years that we lived in Seattle. Um, every week, you know, we would go and play different titles, play new stuff. Sometimes it was great. Sometimes it was a total dud. And we're like, oh, that game was really bad and I didn't mm -hmm. like it. Um, and eventually you start getting ideas in your head. You're just, they just come to you like, oh, well, what, if, what about a game like this? What about a game like that? What if I did this thing? Um, the game that I originally kickstarted and wrote was this one, mm -hmm. um, Eden. And the idea for this game came to me in like 2011, but I didn't kickstart that until 2016. Um, it just took a long, long time. And I stopped working on it for several years, you know, to, to finally culminate in something that actually, um, I felt good about producing and having. So, um, Caroline and I work very closely together, but we have found that we don't, we don't work super well on the same project together. Um, and I think that's, uh, you know, just just a personality thing that like the way we approach design is different so it's much it's much more fruitful to have us um working on separate projects but helping each other with those projects than trying to develop one game together we just kind of found that it doesn't work for us very well so we don't really do that <laughs> but And do you play test uh the game of the other absolutely mm -hmm. yeah all the time i mean we play test it both in actual game sessions and just sort of talking out the rules, talking out parts of it with each other. It's, um, it is such a, such a privilege to have somebody who is so smart about game design mm -hmm. that I can talk to anytime I want because <laughs> <Yeah>. she's <laughs> always here. Um, <laughs> and that like her insights are, are, are sharp and smart and they help me get to the heart of like, identifying the problems or figuring out solutions or exploring new ways to think about it. She is very much part of my, uh, my brain trust, so to speak of <laughs> people that I immediately turn to, to help me with design. Um, yeah. Yeah. So we work together all the time. I mean, it's, it's almost like it's, it's hard to even differentiate when we're not, when we are and when we are working together because it's just so constant interwined kind of yeah. back and forth yeah and that's obviously because we live together and yep. spend yep. a lot of our time together so you know yeah But, i think uh, that you're really yeah, lucky to, to to have um, a person that um it's so into the hobby 
and it's so um, uh, passionate about it so mm-hmm. that, that you, you can t- talk with, with, with her about new titles and try new games and, and stuff like that mm-hmm. and it's it's really rare I yeah I would say I agree I think we were both very lucky um, I mean and, and you could talk about you know part of the reason we got together in the first place was probably our shared interest in the hobby right that we no. We had something to talk about. We like doing it yeah. together. So yeah, you know, it, it works. <laughs> um, and I think that, uh, I mean, to, to give you how deep in this rabbit hole that we are, <laughs> have you ever heard of the game um, Sea Dracula? Uh, yeah, about the animals, the um, like the animals, animals that, court. and you have to dance the case out, <laughs> something mm-hmm, like that. I, mm-hmm. I've never played it, but I, I, I know it. We played it at our wedding. <laughs> okay, cool. We had a band, like a live uh, guitarist and drummer, and we had our friends stage the whole thing, and we played it at the wedding, at the at the reception. R- really so, cool. <laughs> it was ridiculous. Probably, I, I will steal your, your your idea at my my own wedding too. <laughs> it was really fun. It was like it was super super silly, but it was it was a great experience. So, yeah, as you can see, it's an important part of our lives. It mm-hmm. has been since we first started dating. Um, and we've been married now for um, almost seven years. So it's been great. Yeah, cool. Uh, just one last question. Yeah. Um, uh, just tell us, uh, to me and uh, to our viewers, uh, mm-hmm. like, mm, let's say that I want to uh, be a game designer. Mm-hmm. And uh, let's say that I still have played a lot of games. Uh, where, what, what would be my starting point mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. in designing a new game, a new title? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, oh, I think that I think that there are a lot of approaches, um, mm-hmm. and so I can only speak to the one that has worked yeah. for me. Sure, um, of course, but the way that I, I think the way that I got into it. Um, as starting to design was kind of how I, I mentioned at the beginning was if you play a lot of games and you're really immersed in the hobby, then you'll start having ideas, whether you like it or not, you'll, they'll kind of start, oh, hey, you know, is there a game about this? Or, oh, maybe what about this idea? You know, um, getting the ideas is not probably the hardest part. Um, <laughs> those, those will start to come to yeah. you the more <laughs> time you spend in the hobby. So I think the next hurdle to to climb over is to when you start fixing on an idea, you you commit to saying, okay, this is the game I want to try to make. I want to make a game about this thing. Then for me, it really helps to try to get a bigger picture idea of what what are the things that are most critical to you about the game that you want to make doing or not doing. And my, my other person in the brain trust that I mentioned besides Caroline is our friend, Ben, mm-hmm. the, the guy who wrote Microscope. Oh, okay. um, ben is a really good friend of ours. He ran the story games meetup in Seattle for many years. And so we became really close with him. Um, and he lives on the other side of the country now in Massachusetts, but uh, we game with him every week um, online. So we're still really, really close. Especially and, during a pandemic. It's... <laughs> especially during the pandemic. It's worked out perfectly. <laughs> yeah. So he's the other person that I go to for game design discussion and advice. He's a genius. I mean, he's so, so good at getting directly to the, the heart of things. And what his advice was um, that I that I took on was creating these maxims, right? Ideas of like, no matter how, where I take the game, these bullet points at the top of my worksheet are, have to keep, got to be got to be true um so like for epitaph um like i said it's not microscope that was one of my maxims and that's a little bit silly but my my overall point in doing that was to say i want to find new ways to explore this idea of a timeline that was kind of why i put it there um i think another another key maxim for me about epitaph was it's not a mystery Mm -hmm. that was the other and i mentioned that before too right so keeping those things at the top of your list helps you as you're making the rules of the game because you can always go back and say, okay, am I keeping in the core principle of what I wanted this game to be when I set out? And you can change them, of course, if you need to, but having them 
gives you a, a foundation to build from. Um, the next thing I would say, if you want to get into design, is sit down, you know, commit some hours, get get some free time, get some distractions put away. Just write the rules. Just write something, anything. I mean, just put down on paper, like, how would this game actually happen? What is the thing I want to see? Do I want players to do scenes? Do I want them to roll dice? Do I want them to draw cards? Like, do I want them to talk about this, talk about that? I don't know, just make something up. Just throw it on paper. Um, yeah, for instance, then... if, if, if I remember correctly, in Epitaph, there, there's no dice, no cards, nothing at all, right? Yeah. That's correct. There's no random elements in Epitaph at all. Yeah. Um, and and I would say that the problem, probably my biggest flaw as a designer that I keep working on is mechanics before story um, is not the way to do it, in my opinion. So what mm -hmm. I mean by that is like, if I have a really cool idea, I'm like, oh, what if, what if every time you do this, then this happens and then that. I'm getting into the mechanical part of how the game works, but I forget the why do I want the game to do or what am I trying to what experience am I trying to get the players to have mm -hmm. to me that is the foundational part from which the mechanics um, should grow so yeah yeah go ahead. yeah I, 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 I can see your point and I well I would say that it's a, um, a very common pitfall for instance I uh, on, on our channel, we just played uh, Sigmata. I don't know if you know th the game. I don't know that one. Um, it's called uh, Sigmata. Uh, this signal kills fa fascist. Mm. It's it, it's set in the in the U.S., uh, but it's a uh, dystopic uh, U.S. in which uh, like there's there, there's this uh, re regime, this um, oppressive re regime. It's like. Mm, Trump by one thousand, mm -hmm. and and you play as as the resistance. Okay. But the problem is that the mechanics they're really uh, strict, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. they kind of like uh, limit the, the scope of the um, of, of the topic. Mm -hmm. uh, you find yourself more involved in, into the mechanics and less into the topic of the of the of the resistance. And, yeah. and that's a really common pitfall. And I, I think that's what you meant before, right? Yeah, more or less. Yeah, I agree that that having a cool idea for how like mechanically the game will work um, can it can be a way to design. But my experience is that it's more effective if you think about what you want the players to feel and mm -hmm. what kind of story you want them to tell and then use that to, to help you figure out what mechanics you want to make rather than going the other way. Because what, what happens if you start with a mechanical thing and say, okay, they're gonna roll, yeah, let's just make something. They're gonna roll a D4 and then draw a card and then that's what's gonna happen. So like, if you if you bind yourself with that, then you can really get trapped in a structure where your rules and your mechanical things are forcing you to make choices about how the game works that limit what the game can do. Um, I will give you an example from Epitaph that's not mm -hmm. about dice at all, but um, it was my friend Ben. Um, he played that game I mentioned before about um, the the sword fighter woman. And um, at that point in the design process, um, you have in the setup, you you make a goal for the departed, right? Something they worked on during their life. And at that point in my, my iterations of the game, um, they always failed the goal. They, you, the, it was just, they don't succeed. You make the goal and they never got it. And after we played, Ben was giving me feedback and he said, hey, why can't they succeed at the goal? And I just kind of like, I let that sit for a day and I'm like, Ben, I have no idea why. Yeah, like, let's there's no reason. <laughs> throw that mechanic out. Let's <laughs> open it up. And it worked so much better. Like the game mm -hmm. has so much more availability. Options, yeah. So many more options. And what I realized was that that was a holdover from the old version of the game that I mentioned, okay. where it was much more about like mourning and regret. And so having the goal always be a failure oh, yeah. it, captured yeah. that tone. You see what I'm because saying? Because it, it used to like kickstart the mourning and, and, and the keening. Right. Uh, yeah. the, the what's keeping me bound, you know, like failure, of course, of the goal. But now, now the game can do so much more because you can succeed and then. Okay, I, I achieved my goal. What happens now, right? 
I became famous at age, you know, 25. And mm -hmm. then I still had 35 years of life. Whoa, like what, <laughs> what did I do for the rest of that time? So like, or I just fixed uh, a summer camp <laughs> and then died the next year. Exactly. Like, <laughs> you know, it, it can really, it really opens up the possibilities. And that was me being bound by a mechanic rather than allowing the story to drive how the game works. Does that make sense? Yeah, well, uh, if I understood correctly, uh, I can give another example yeah, uh, from Monster Heart. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that uh, in that case, the, the process, it, it uh, just like you described, like Avery wanted a, a mechanic to deliver the fact that uh, you as a teenager, you're not in control of your sexuality. So there's this mechanics called um, turns someone on mm -hmm. and it basically you can roll the dice to like um, yeah, to turn somebody on, mm -hmm. but you mm -hmm. can use that mechanics on everyone. Uh, right. Regardless, regardless of, of, the, yeah, yeah. of the sexual orientation and, and stuff like that. Yeah. And f for instance, in, a, in, a, in one of my game of uh, Monster Heart, I my character was um, was gay, but mm -hmm. in a, in a session uh, he was t turned on by a, a girl. Mm -hmm. So he um, he thought that he was gay. He, he started to build um, an identity of of this gay, uh, I would say, archetype or gay mm -hmm. um, image that. Uh, the the, the the television the the media they kind of project mm -hmm. but right uh, it, it all f fell down when it was turned on by a girl mm, i see it it like broke his self image yeah. and and made him question yeah and who and he that, was. that's yeah. something that the game w wants to address as a topic and th that's topic before the the, the mechanics so mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. topic first the mechanics later and the mechanic right the mechanics have to like um aid you into exploring the topic that y you want your game to address i think that's a great example yeah ultimately it's you should not let the story you should let the story guide how the game mm. works and not the and what story you want to tell yeah yeah so getting back to your question of design i think that that's hard. I mean, that's something I've struggled with for a long time. And I think a lot of designers do because you get a cool idea and you're like, oh, what if it does this thing? And we do that. And you just, you want to make it work. And then sometimes you have to let that go and just, you know, say, I'm, it's a cool idea, but it doesn't work for the game. So I'm going to toss it. And that can be really hard, but it's, it's almost always the right choice if you've recognized it. Um, in my other suggestion for getting into design is make some friends uh, <laughs> because you need to play test a lot. I did for Epitaph. I played it. Um, I think it was six times in one month during the pandemic here. Like it was like three or four months ago uh, oh. before the Kickstarter. Um, I just, I just got all my friends. I sent out, you know, like a polling website of scheduling availability. I'm like, guys, you know, sign up. I'll coordinate all these games. And I boom, slammed it together and played it like once or twice a week for a month. Um, and that was such a productive time in finalizing the rules because playing it that many times in a row really helped me see what was working and what needed more tightening. Mm -hmm. um, so my my recommendation is play test a lot and keep keep revisiting everything. Like nothing is frozen, nothing is settled until you print the book, right? Like every rule has the possibility to just need to be changed and maybe something you've had in the game for ages and ages like that example i gave of the goal you might play the game for a year and then finally say wait a minute you know this is this is the part that's not working and i need to change yeah it. I, I, I don't need that part yeah mm -hmm. and you have to um, like be brave enough to this to discharge an, an entire like part of your of your son of your <laughs> yeah yeah of your offspring yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly exactly um, Which is really hard, uh, regardless of game designing and writing and stuff like that. It's it's always exactly. hard to like, discharge a part of what you've created because it's a part of you. Exactly. And, yeah, I feel that too. Probably, yeah, the, too. probably that's that's the hardest part of um, 
of the um, creative process. I agree. Yeah, yeah. You, you gave uh, some fantastic advice. Um, thank you very much, and uh, uh, thank you for your time. I, I really you. look forward to playing uh, Epitaph. And uh, for our viewers, uh, we will play Epitaph on uh, on the channel. So if you're interested awesome. in the game, you can like just keep on watching us and, and following us. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> Mark, I'm really sorry, but we probably would play it in Italian. So <laughs> you, That's you, you no prob problem. probably <laughs> wouldn't be able to to follow it. But I <laughs> I, I, I I'll kind of understand that... what you're doing generally. Yeah, <laughs> in the setup steps anyway. But you, I, I sense that, that you have followed a lot of uh, games of, of, of your game enough. So uh, one yeah. more wouldn't make, a, wouldn't make a, a difference. I'm mostly really excited to have somebody who can help other people get access to this mm, game yeah, because it's sure. not Italian, right? Um, that's, I, a, as a, that's our mission as a channel, yeah. you know, to... Mm -hmm. uh, like to, to take a game that maybe mm, it's it nobody has never mm, listened about uh, and, and played mm -hmm. and and as a um, as a person interested in the, in the hobby you can see mm, a group playing the game and and you right. can like sense okay it, it's a game for me i, I, I didn't right. know this game I, I want to buy it and st stuff like that so yeah. that's for basically who... it's basically our, our mission as a channel. Yeah, I think that's amazing, and and I'm really I'm really glad to Thank you. <laughs> to be able to to be part of that. Um, I'm grateful. I'm grateful for that. So thank you. You're welcome. Uh, do you want to add anything? Um, a little bit of promotion. Uh, yeah. Last second, which is Go that on. <laughs> I expect the game. Um, I told the Kickstarter backers such as yourself that I would have it done by March. That is definitely still on track to happen, um, possibly earlier if I can swing it. Um, things obviously have been a little crazy in America for a little while, so I've been a little busy, but um, but it's, it's coming along. Like it really, the production is on track for me to get the product ready by that point. So once the game is done and out to the backers, that's when I will put it up for sale on our website. So you can get the PDF or the book um, less than three games which I think you'll probably have a link for mm -hmm. um, somewhere in here anyway. And I also want to want to uh, to promote my wife's project real quick um, that she's working on. It's called Fedora Noir. Mm -hmm. And if you like noir films or like detective noir specifically, this game will be for you. It is uh, designed to be a game that explores that genre of films. Um, and you tell a detective story. Uh, the coolest part about the game is that one player, it's a four player game. One player plays the detective, but another player plays the hat, which is the detective's like inner monologue and okay. thoughts and feelings. And so the, the hat just gets to like sort of narrate what the detective is thinking, um, much like how you have that happening in a lot of noir films. Um, it's a really cool game, and we're going to put it on Kickstarter probably next okay, year. Okay, so, so uh, <laughs> it will be a Kickstarter soon of uh, Fedora noir, noir. Okay. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Okay, promotion. Promotion period Done. over, but that's uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's the projects that we're working on. So I'm I'm finishing up this game. She's working on that one. Um, it's things are humming along, and it's going to be yeah. really it's gonna be really fun. And we will continue to follow your work and your wife's work as well. And um, as I said before, thank you very much for your time. It was a pleasure to to meet you, and um, I want to thank you all our um, uh, viewers and, and supporters. Uh, to watch uh, this interview and uh, and just see you later and and see you for in, during the next um, actual play or the next interview or the next or the next video so thank you for watching and thank bye you everyone <laughs>